What's up, wild people? Welcome back to my channel. If you're new, I'm Alexandria Denise, and the dog days of summer is fast approaching in the southeast and certainly where you are too. If you're a new gardener, then you might be thirsty for some information on how to help your plants beat the heat. Well, keep your cool because we're about to dip into a pool of knowledge on the best times to water your garden. Let's dive in. Cause we about to dive in. Please come to my concert. I'm selling tickets later. <laughs> this is why I'm on YouTube. Obviously, water is an important element, but not just to living things. It helps erode rocks, breaking them down into smaller particles that can eventually become soil, acts as a vessel of transportation, and aid in Earth's temperature regulation. Yet, we know it best for cooking and hydration purposes. Plants are no different. First, it helps to understand how plants actually use water. You may have heard that many living organisms are made up of a percentage of it. Approximately 95% of a plant's tissues is made up of water. In specific, their cells are structured differently than animal cells. There are a few similarities, but the highlights of this topic are the vacuoles and chloroplast. Plants absorb water and minerals from the soil through tiny hairs on their roots in a process called osmosis, which is the transfer of water from an area of high concentration to low. From there, it moves up the xylem and distributed to needed parts of the plant. Vacuoles are predominantly found in plant cells and are scattered throughout, varying in shapes and sizes. They are storage sacs filled with water or sometimes the plant's toxic metabolic byproducts. Vacuoles help maintain the osmotic pressure in plant cells through turgidity and rigidity, and it's these fluid-filled sacs that act as bones, giving the plant structure while also allowing it to be flexible. If plants are underwatered, they don't receive their required amount to maintain the fluid in these sacs, so they start to wilt. As a reverse to this, overwatering can fill soil pores in the ground, blocking the flow of oxygen and suffocate the roots. It prevents the osmosis process, jamming the root hairs, leading to a decline in the plant's health, even encourage diseases. The right amount of watering paired with well-draining soil helps maintain the fluidity of the vacuoles. In addition to pressure regulation within the plant cell, water helps aid in photosynthesis. You may have heard of this as the process in which plants make sugar or glucose for food, but diving a bit deeper as to how, it takes place in the chloroplast. From there, chlorophyll is responsible for capturing the sun's light rays, then carbon dioxide is taken in through the plant stomata. Combined with the hydrogen bond stripped from water allows plants to make glucose to fuel their growth. The oxygen bond in H2O isn't needed, so it's released as waste back into the air for us to breathe. So, we breathe in oxygen, released by plants during photosynthesis, and breathe out carbon dioxide to be taken in by plants to be used for it. Nature truly is a give and take system. But when is the best time plants perform photosynthesis? Plants mainly perform photosynthesis during the time of day that light is the greatest, usually during the hottest parts. This is when the plant's stomata, or leaf pores, are fully open, absorbing needed carbon dioxide for the process. Less than 2% of water absorbed is actually used during photosynthesis. The rest is used to maintain the plant structure or is lost through a process called transpiration. Like breathing, plants respire, which is simply the exchange of gas as described by scientists. Transpiration is the constant transfer of water from the soil to the evaporation of water through the plant's leaves, flowers, even stems. Plants transpire even at night as well as taking in water, though much slower than during the day. Evaporation doesn't just happen on the leaves of the plant, but from the soil itself. Practices such as mulching with wood chips, pine needles, or straw is important to slow water loss. To help maintain moisture, gardeners incorporate cocoa core into their soil as a natural replacement instead of peat moss. Now that you understand how plants use water, there are actually two answers to the question when to water your plants. 
But first, splash that like button and subscribe to the tribe if you've learned something so far. The first answer is in the mornings, at least four hours before the day's highest temperature, which is usually when photosynthesis is in full swing and the plant has enough stored water to withstand the heat. The second is when the plant actually needs it. In-ground plants may do all right to skip a watering session or two because it can pull from groundwater. Depending on your climate and plant's location in your garden, potted plants, however, must be tended to immediately once signs of stress is detected. Watering your plants when it needs it is better than waiting for the perfect time. Based on my growing experience, here's some advice to keep in mind. Morning Sessions Early morning waterings between 6 a.m. and 9 a.m. are always safer. It gives the plant plenty of time to absorb its needed amount, and if you don't have a fancy irrigation system, there's less worry of getting the leaves wet. Plenty of time for wet foliage to dry during the milder part of the day. And like me, if you're not an early morning person, watering your garden at least four hours before the highest daily temperature is fine too. If your highest temperature isn't until 3 p.m., you'll be okay to water around 11 a.m. Early to mid-morning waterings maximizes the plant's survival of the heat and prepares it for photosynthesis. Afternoon Sessions Usually I would say not to worry about getting the foliage wet, but this one is tricky. Water isn't as pure as it used to be. A lot of hard metals, salts, even additives in our water supply can burn your leaves if not the water itself. If you don't have an irrigation system, hose filter, or oya, and must water in the heat of the day, water at the soil line. If you get the leaves wet and the plant is potted but portable, either gently shake off the excess water or move the plant in a shadier spot until dry. Not all plants have a strong protective cuticle that repels water from its leaves like this Meyer lemon tree, so a little help is needed here. Moving it in shade gives it time to recover from the heat stress anyway. Evening and night sessions. I get it. Some days we hit the ground running and put our plants on the back burner. If it's been a hard heat stress day and your plants look a bit weary, giving them just a bit of water, preferably two hours before nightfall, is okay. Remember, they still take in water at night, but at a slower rate. This can help them recover some during the night, then you can resume with a full watering the next morning. Just don't make this a normal practice. Nighttime chills can encourage fungus and root rot for disease to set in. Plus, the cool soil is attractive to nighttime pests like slugs. It's also worth mentioning to water fruit-bearing perennials such as blueberries weeks before to encourage a bountiful harvest. Now I mainly water my garden the old-fashioned way, but if you're interested in convenience, here are some tools to help you out. Oya. Oh yeah. People in the past were living in the future because this terracotta clay pot came in handy when you had a large farm to tend to. Oyas are from the ancient day. They were buried near desired plants with only the top sticking out. After filling with water, the same process of osmosis occurs. When the soil around the oya is wet, the pot retains water. As the soil dries, water moves out of the pot into the soil to keep it moist giving your plants a steady supply. I actually use this for my watermelons and will link it below in my Amazon shop for those interested. Gallon jugs or water canteens. Here's another one of my go-tos. When I don't have time to hook up the hose in the mornings, I use this canteen left over from my trucking days. I keep it full enough to pour where needed. Quick and simple. Garden hose filter. Can be good for removing some harmful elements in your water, though I hear it's a hit or miss with heavy metals. I personally don't have any experience with this device, but if you do, share it in the comments or on True Nature's Facebook group. Irrigation system. Ah, the one that's got everybody talking. I have explored the bootleg option for this using fish tank tubes. I wasn't successful, but it definitely ranges from DIYs to expensive models. 
The tubes are placed a little below the soil or right on top to water plants. Some can operate off the osmosis process, others manually controlled valves or timers. All can be great options suited for your watering needs, but it's important to remember to plan your sessions based on the variety of plant, the location of the plant, be it in ground, raised bed or potted, sun or shade, your climate, season, and time of day. I hope I didn't drown you with information there, but like water to plants, splashing that like button helps this channel grow and branch out to reach more people. Subscribe to the tribe here on YouTube and connect with me via other platforms in the description below. Forage for more videos on my channel that pique your interest and feast with me on True Nature's Kitchen, where I share wild game dishes, keto, paleo, and other wholesome recipes. Also, let's confuse the heck out of people that clicked off early and type the word osmosis in the comments. Until next time, dig your roots deep, grow beyond your haters reach, and stay wild.